Yeah, excellent. Got it in the back. Thank you, Mike. Super. So, my name's Peter. I work for the IOE Innovation Centre in the UK. Uh, we're in London. Um, I'm going to talk to you. This is not going to be a technology presentation. I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint a few people. I know that's why most people are here. I'm going to talk to you about innovation, about the process that we go through, uh, about some of the projects that we've got and what we've done to get those on board and how those are influencing the rest of Cisco. Uh, and then I'm going to leave you with a few ideas and call outs for what you can do to help us, to help the other innovation centres and so on, speed up the process of innovation, speed up that creativity uh, and try to improve the outcomes for, for all of us. Just as a quick show of hands, who, who here is from a customer, Cisco customer organisation? You're all very welcome. Uh, who's here from a partner organisation? And a good handful. And does that mean the rest of Cisco people? One, two, three. Okay. Okay. Chris, you didn't put your hand up. I know you're Cisco. There we go. And who else? And then who's here for the for the credits? Yeah, most of you. Okay, cool. So, all right. So hopefully I'm going to touch on some of the things that you that were going to interest all of you. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit first of all about about the innovation centres. We are. We've been going for about three years. We're, we're the, first of, the first of these centres to exist. I'll step out of the way a little bit. We, we're here to look at some of the things that fall through the gaps. Some of the ideas that don't quite get picked up for whatever reason. Some of the things that perhaps uh, it's not quite a good fit for organisational structure, process and so on. And it's the sort of thing that happens in every large organisation. You know, process, structure, these things are imperfect because we built them. And there's always things that don't quite fit that really should. And you've got to find a way of gathering that, getting the value out of it. And that's, that was our reason for being. We're primarily UK focused. We'll do things that were relevant for the UK market, for UK partners. But they will always have some sort of global resonance for Cisco uh, and for our partner and customer community. That's a bit about uh, a few facts and things. But uh, our, our intention has been to use local talent to get that into the company, to find new ways of doing things. We're in the sales organization rather than development. So this is about bringing in different skill sets, looking at different ways of working within that part of the organization. I'm going to get something interesting soon, I promise. That's the process that we go through to qualify what we will do. We have uh, we got six or so projects under management at the moment. They're all relatively significant. What we, the process we have to go through, if we want to pick up an idea, We've got to make an assessment as to whether it's the right thing for us to do within the country, whether we've got the partner capability, the UK skills, and so on. But importantly, when we decided we want to do something, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the company thinks it's a good idea. And we need to do that advocacy internally with customers, with partners, etc., to actually get the point across. So there's an element of evangelizing, of advocacy that comes with what we do. Hey, I like the clicky thing. It's good. Just to say, these are the projects that we've got going. I'll talk through some of the core things. These are the partners that we've got in our ecosystem at the moment. I'm going to point out a couple, which I'll come back to in a minute when we go through. I go through some of the projects. Pure LiFi, you'll find them downstairs. They're in the Innovation Centre booth in the World of Solutions. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I realise I clicked through it pretty quickly. Yeah, we'll make them all available. Pure LiFi are in the booth downstairs. They're part of a Light as a Service project. If you're here for the session just now, you've heard them talking, um, speaker whose name I've forgotten, talking about connected lighting. I'm going to talk to you about the proof of concept project that we ran that was the birth child of that product. And that's where that's come from now, and it's pushed back into the business as usual. Pure Life are an extension of that. They're doing light over, uh, data over light with some really interesting use cases for security customers we're not allowed to talk about. We've also got Bronze Labs with us. Uh, they are on the IoT pod yesterday. They'll be in the World of Solutions today. They're looking at applications mobile applications in the rail environment. We've had a connected stations project, and again, I'll talk a bit about that. But they're here, and I thoroughly recommend you go and talk to them. They're really interesting guys. Three projects I'm going to talk to you about that we've done. Again, this is not going to be a technology conversation. I'm going to talk to you about where these ideas came, came from, why I thought it was important, what we've done. Light as a service. We now call that connected lighting within Cisco. This is a project that's been running for two years within our centre. And we did it because we thought it was a good idea. The, the principles of it, it's POE lighting internally. You don't need a separate power network. Uh, actually, what we wanted to do originally was uh, use UPOE to do external street lights. But 
and we've signed away a lot of the rights to those in 25-year PFI deals with the private sector. So we can't really do a lot about that. But we can do something about internalising. We can do a lot to improve the economics of it, the flexibility of it, improve the productivity of spaces based on light. It's got use cases in some really interesting things. Classrooms are fantastic because you can control the mood through the intelligent use of the light, which, if you're a teacher, to be able to get something done about that post-lunch stupor that students fall into, yeah, that's an hour of lost learning. That's almost pointless as a lesson plan. Something you can do to just calm that all down, get them back, get them focused, extremely valuable. Post-operative wards in, health, in, uh, in hospitals are fantastic because they're not fantastic at the moment. That's the problem. Thank you. They, they don't manage your environment. It's a very busy, very active, very poorly lit or well lit uh, environment that doesn't allow you to recover. You've got a lot of interruptions, a lot of disruption. And actually, they've done studies. If you just manage the light during the night and stop the disruption to sleep patterns, people will get out of hospital a day earlier. It's four days rather than five. It's 20% saving on bedtimes. That's extraordinary. You aggregate that up, that's worth its weight in, well, it's probably not gold. There's probably not that much gold. You know, it's extremely valuable. And we're going to prove that works. 17% of buildings, uh, building costs goes on lighting. What's interesting is what you can do about the rest of it with the light. We worked with UCL, which is a university in, uh, in London. They have a climate chamber, and you can put people in that, and you can get them to assess what they think the temperature is. And we use some intelligent lighting to just make the color warmer, cooler. And in the mid-range of comfort, you can get people to experience one or two degrees of thermal comfort either way from what it actually is. And when you're talking about something that's about 53% of your entire cost for running the building, that's a significant saving. If you're just turning down the cooling, turning up the heating, just that little bit less, a little bit frequently, you can maintain the same level of comfort. That's pretty big. Uh, as I say, I'll make this stuff available because that's... That's what we did. And we staffed up a team to just do a rapid prototype, proof of concept, develop energy-wise into a protocol that can actually control lights. That's about as technical as I get. Protocol, that's about it. And we've now got three demonstrations of that in the UK, in UCL in the climate chamber, in our own offices at Create, and in the University of Strathclyde, which had better work because it was a new building and they forgot to put in an overlay lighting network. So if the experimental stuff fails, those classrooms are dark. Never mind. They're not going to fail. Ooh, the guys did some good work. There's some really interesting stuff about energy saving. I'm in the interest of time. I'll move on. You can all see that in the slides afterwards. The station environment. We talk a lot in Cisco about the connected transport as a theme. We've got roadways. We've got connected rail. I think there's a thing on airports now. I don't know. There's lots of it. We've not really looked at the station environment, and the station environment is really interesting because that has a lot of challenges that get unaddressed by a focus on service from the rail operators. Because what they're interested in is passenger revenue through ticketing and maybe a bit of retail. They've never invested in the station environment as either a revenue generator or as an operational pain point. Right? And so there's a lot of focus on track safety, track security, very little about the passenger experience in the in station environment. You do get investment in rail stations, but it's normally the large ones. So in the UK, we know that's the 17 stations that are the big centrally managed network rail stations. All the others are kind of left to their own devices. What it means is you've got lots of discrete networks. They're all siloed. Nothing talks to each other. There's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of obsolete. We wanted to strip all of that out and put in a converged network. OK, that's not especially innovative, not especially creative. That's what Cisco does. That's its business. But Putting it into the rails created its own problems. We had particular issues on security, particular issues on emergency comms. We managed to figure those out. We now have Bronze Labs who... Sarah, say hello. There we go. Sarah at the back. If you get a chance to say hello to Sarah and Richard, they will be at the IoT Hub or downstairs at World Solutions. Downstairs. There we go. And we put this out there. It's a platform. So we've said, OK, there are a lot of issues that you can resolve once you've got this. We put that out. We had some startups come in, do some rapid application development on that. 
ran a competition, et cetera, et cetera. And some really interesting ideas came out of that, people from Dav like Davra Networks and so on. Uh, and the Bronze Labs guys have done a brilliant app little application to doing incident reporting within stations using a lot of the presence capability of things like Meraki, using IPix, all, all that sort of good stuff. Da -da -da -da. Move on from that. Uh, yeah, it looks a bit like that. And it's a Cisco presentation, so I had to put in some sort of complex network diagram. It's part of the rules. There you go. Finally, one last one to talk about. Lights, which was a technology development. Stations, which was more of a, a commercial alignment. This is a business model challenge. How do you improve the business model for high street Wi-Fi? I'm on high street, town centers, anything that's sort of sub-city region, okay? We're talking about city Wi-Fi a lot, a kind of smart and connected community use case. You don't often see that drawn down to a lower level, and actually we're missing a lot of value from that. Because what we, what we find in the UK is that the model is largely based on this, which is okay. I will share the slides, I promise you. It's all, it, it, it's all right if that's in a city. You can, this was done, I did this deliberately small because the next one goes really big. But now I realize that you guys at the back can't really see that. So that's a bit of a fail, I, I apologize. But the idea is you've got the Wi-Fi network in place and you sell a bit of advertising on the splash page and then you sell a bit of internet access to people in the city. Uh, maybe you sell something to the mobile operators to do some traffic offloading. Bottom line, that's not a very imaginative model. And in the UK, the service providers can actually make that work commercially. You can't get people to pay for this if you're also selling this. That doesn't work. People don't want to. Does that mean? People don't want to pay, spend money on, on small sale stuff because they've just spent a load of money on 4G licenses. So they're not really interested in buying someone else's network either. So there's a lot of issues with this model. So we said, okay, what else can we do? So we started looking at what we could do with the location and presence capability and CMX and all that good stuff. And there's plenty of people out here who can tell you about that. But the bit that was missing is the content side. And so we've worked with a small company called Kilsa, who do a local social network in Glasgow and Edinburgh in Scotland. 70,000 users, quite small, but they're repurposing social to be reflective of local communities, neighborhoods, and so on. And they think that that brings something very tangible and real and valuable to people, which some of the bigger social networks, such enterprises, have lost. You know, the, the, the idea of the university campus as the roots of Facebook are, are long gone now. And the idea that there's lots of value in neighborhood and community interactions that just has never been translated into the digital world. When you layer that with the presence and location capabilities of, of Wi-Fi, and in this instance, it was using Meraki, you can actually do localized delivery of some really interesting content. It's not just basic offers and things like that for retailers, but actually interesting things. So if you're in a coffee shop, maybe, oh, did you know there's a running club that meets here? every Thursday evening, something like that. You know, it's the local interactions, the local value points that they want to exploit. And off the back of that, we think you can do a whole load of other stuff that's really interesting. But I'm going to move on from that because it needs us a time. You can still do small sale if you like, but I still don't think there's a lot of money in it. But anyway, that was a business model integration because we need to generate additional value for service provider partners in order to give them a reason to invest in uh, in city Wi-Fi, which we think is an underlying infrastructure that's important if we're going to be looking at smart cities, smart communities, particularly below that city level. Some of the things they've done in Glasgow, it's really interesting. How am I doing on time, Jim? Uh, okay, cool. Um, I wanted to wrap up with a couple of, couple of points because we've got customers, we've got partners, and we've got Cisco people. I've been doing this for two and a half years in Cisco. Uh, I didn't do anything else before. Uh, this open innovation idea model is all I've ever done in the company. And I would say that in the last year, there's been a, a massive uptick in the capabilities and in the openness of the company to looking at how it innovates. So opening up all sorts of capabilities, all sorts of interesting channels for us to be able to exploit. And I'm quite excited about that because it gives me more routes in. You know, to do what we've done so far, we had to fight tooth and nail to get stuff done. And I don't think we're going to have those struggles anymore because I think there's a real shift coming. If you're Cisco people, there are lots of routes for your ideas. I'd like to know them. That's where we get a lot of value from. 
from the, from the field teams, from those people that work closely with customers. I'm interested in all those ideas. And the other innovation centres will be too. If you're in the partner community, we want to work with you to be able to do these things. No, we don't, we don't do these things alone. We do what we do, and we want to help others do what they do best. And it's about moving everything forward together. It's an ecosystem strategy. If you're customers, we're interested in co-development. All of these things were done with a customer. They get the proof of concept. They get the brownie points for being innovation, thought leaders, et cetera, et cetera. But it gives us that intimacy and that understanding of how we work, of the pain points. Uh, and, it, and it's challenging, getting all that stuff done. You know, we've missed deadlines, they've missed deadlines. We're upset, we're disappointed, we've been misunderstandings. But we've pushed it through, and then you've got a relationship to build on. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say to you. Happy to take some questions. I'm also around, so just have a little chat afterwards if you like. Thank you.